Thank you so much for all of that information. Um, it's hard to imagine a better source for for this for these details. It's definitely not part of mainstream conversation for folks. So I hope I hope that sparks a lot of curiosity and folks will start to put um, questions in the chat. But while you're all adding your questions, um, I could kick off. So you you're talking about kind of a, a situation that existed before. October, but I think because Gaga, Gaza, the Gaza genocide is still ongoing, it's what is on a lot of people's minds. Can you just talk a little bit about what is the impact of the genocide against the Palestinians in Gaza have on Israel's economy and the high tech sector and those terms? Uh, well, the w one of the things that that I was uh, trying to to bring across, I'm not sure if, if that was clear enough, is that uh, you cannot separate the Israeli military from the high-tech sector. Uh, and that those companies, uh, th those units, like the 8200 unit, this is a unit, uh, the, the most famous Israeli intelligence unit, which um, soldiers have to spend years in order to be part of that unit and, um, and, and to, to, to undergo a lot of training. And this unit, um, the reason that so, that so many Israeli, young Israelis want to serve in this unit, despite the long service time, uh, is that with a graduation from that unit, you get an almost free ticket into the Israeli tech sector. Because companies just, just hearing, okay, you served in 8 to 100, you can work for us. Um, now, this is actually what we're seeing in Gaza now, that this company is uh, th this this unit? Sorry, uh, but, but working with the companies and the the companies that of the graduates of that unit, which are uh, supposedly independent private companies, uh, are working hand in hand with special dispensation by the Israeli Ministry of Defense, so they have security clearance to build up a database of Palestinians in order to, uh, of, of faces of Palestinians, of locations, of movements of Palestinians, um, and in order to kill them. Now, which, which is something that the whole world is seeing. They are not able to hide it. There was this article by Yuval Avraham in 972 magazine, it's called the Mass Assassination Factory, which explains how this works. So the tech sector has been exposed. They don't have control of their own um, operations. And you can see how the private companies are, are recruited to work for the government. So they cannot be considered to be private companies anymore. That is what gets a lot of Israelis to panic. So some Israelis who support the genocide and wanna be part of the genocide and are willing to pay that price and are willing to be part of that system uh, uh, without thinking about the consequences or, or uh, the, the fact that they might go to prison for this. Um, they are they are doing this, but there are of course others. There are colleagues from these companies who are saying, no, no. If I if I am now so, sort of as a private company participate in a genocide, then th th that's not part of my job description. That's not something that I could then la later go and work for another tech company uh, in in another country and just uh, and move on with my life. So these people are just leaving. And, and that's what, what we see with these uh, tech companies, that they're not able to, to um, recruit, and, and that uh, these Israelis who are the potential cust uh, employees of these companies are just leaving the country in very large numbers. And they left, a, a, actually there, there's a town in Cyprus. Uh, Cyprus is, re is very close to Israel, so for a lot of Israelis it's very easy. And there's a town in Cyprus where, where you now hear more Hebrew than Greek, because there's so many Israelis that just took their whole families and moved there. Yeah, and I know there are a lot of trackers now out there for tracking these companies and making that information public, as well as ones that are um, also investing. And so um, similar to kind of the past two webinars we've had where it's talking about you know complicity, um, beyond specifically Israeli tech companies, but other tech companies, um, I wanted to turn to to Intel for a second because I know very publicly the BDS movement has launched a campaign uh, to force Intel uh, to revoke their decision to invest twenty five billion 
in uh, the new a new chip making plant in Israel that was originally slated for manufacturing in the U.S. Um, it's a really specific ask, as is as is normal for BDS movement. Um, this investment pledge would be the biggest in Israel's history, if I'm if I'm not wrong. Um, so, what does this mean, uh, both for Israel and for Intel? I wonder if you want to talk a little bit more about that new campaign. Yeah, well, uh, Israel's um, relationship with with Intel goes back quite a while. And in fact, uh, the uh, the CEO of Intel is a, is a Zionist, uh, and this is something that uh, previous Israeli governments have, have tried to make the case that uh, by giving various subsidies and various uh, grants and loan guarantees to Intel, they are then then Intel would actually be making a, a sensible investment by having this factory in Kiryat Gat, which is. Um, has become a very vital part of the Israeli apartheid system and a very important uh, element in financing the Israeli system of oppression. Uh, so the campaign against Intel is long coming, but now with uh, the genocide, that's exactly the moment in which we see that it's not just a question of ethics, it's also a question of uh, wise investment. And the shareholders of Intel are uh, actually being um, well, tricked by their own uh, board for agreeing to invest in a state which um, in an article by a former Israeli general, Yitzhak Brik, a very prominent Israeli general, he called the state of Israel the Tita Titanic. So would you put a, a 25 billion investment on the Titanic? Um, Intel has reported that 17% of their staff in Israel have um, are, are soldiers who fight now in Gaza, 17% participating in the genocide. Uh, Intel has also uh, provided the Israeli arms industry with a chip, a, a computer chip for a system that has been developed by Israel's largest arms company called Elbit System, uh, which is um, used, it's exported mostly to the Netherlands, uh, but it's also used by the Israeli soldiers in Gaza. And it's supposed to be a computer that coordinates the movement of soldiers. So from an ethical point of view, Intel is complicit in those crimes. And of course, that's a very good reason uh, for, for having a campaign against Intel, finding alternatives to Intel, boycotting where we can, divesting where we can. Um, but now uh, there was an article about how this computer system that is provided by Elbit Systems um, with the Intel chip inside, is not really working. And it's not working for the same reason that the Israeli military is not functioning properly. And the, the uh, Israelis are, are so, they've adopted this racist perspective as if Palestinians are not real human beings and, and, have, and they are underestimating them so much that they are not developing very effective weapons in oppressing them. Uh, so, that's another reason that Intel is making a very, very bad investment uh, by deciding to, to operate in uh, Israel and to uh, put in more money. And I think uh, there is still time for the shareholders of Intel to uh, raise their voice and say, what are you doing? Uh, we don't want to own, own shares in a company that is committing suicide by uh, investing in a failing project. Uh, and and uh, it, it's there is still time to cancel this investment plan and uh, and uh, and save Intel basically. Yeah, good. And I mean, I think that you know BDS in general, but what you've just said just underscores this whole idea that human rights abuses should be expensive. They um, absolutely um, there's a relationship between the fiduciary. Um, duties of boards of companies all over the world and paying attention to what the company is doing um, to humans and um, and in particular Gaza. So thank you for that. There's a great question that's come in that extends this conversation a bit. Um, Jamila asked, what do you consider the significance or long-term implications of the U.S. buying into the tech sector, as you mentioned? So thinking long-term, I think is a really interesting way of questioning this. 
Yeah, well, I think that uh, when George Bush, uh, President Bush uh, Jr., uh, made the decision to establish the Department of Homeland Security and to put so much money into the um, um, technology of surveillance and oppression and make Israel the model of how uh, the Homeland Security state should look like in the US, that I think was a move that uh, would would be remembered by many as uh, uh, one of the milestones in the decline of the U.S. empire. I think it was the uh, the decision to say, look at this apartheid state, this settler colony uh, in Palestine, uh, and and how they oppress people just because of their religion or their ethnicity or their nationality, uh, where where this technology is exported to the rest of the world. Um, to oppress LGBTQIA people and uh, every kind of um, oppressed minority, then this is something that the U.S. also wants to have. And we've seen that uh, with the police uh, brutality in the U.S. against African Americans, the Black Lives Matter movement, which highlighted how many police units in the United States have received training from Israeli security companies and equipment from Israeli security companies. And the point is not that this makes them, the police more powerful or more deadly in, in terms of, of the ability of their weapons to kill. That's really not the point. The point is that this is a technology that is created by people who believe that there are two kinds of people. That's the apartheid idea. Uh, and and they teach the, the, the US police to consider civilians as potential targets. Once you adopt this worldview and you start looking at people as a potential security risk rather than as a person, then uh, all of the biases, all of the um, r racial biases that these police officers already have uh, are uh, then then encouraged and uh, to, to culminate in acts of, of violence. And I think this has done tremendous damage to the United States. Uh, and this this uh, violence, the police brutality in the United States is a problem, and it has also economic significance and, and uh, consequences. And the fact that the United States uh, is um, suffering from severe problems of fake news and pop, right wing populism and and, and uh, out of control racism, um, uh, homophobia, these are problems that are exacerbated if you think that you can solve them with um, um, military security technology, surveillance, that sort of thing. Uh, and, and by choosing to invest in the Israeli security sector, that's exactly what the US did. Absolutely. So we are gonna wrap up after this last question. And um, you know, so far we've been able to, in each of these webinars, try to end on either an action or just something that folks can really take away. So I wonder, you know, I think one of the things that I'm really blown away by in listening to you is that this information that you're giving us is not really circulating. There's a pervasive, the, the myth that Israel's tech sector is thriving is absolutely pervasive. Um, it's hard to escape. And so how can we work collectively to actually expose this? I mean, ultimately racist lie, you know, and destroy this idea um, that investing in Israel, you know, maybe morally wrong, but it's economically sound. Like, I think that's kind of where a lot of tech companies are falling. And, um, you know, we're trying to make the connection between the morality and the economics, but also like, you know, just how do we, how do we get the message out more? Well, um, I mean, the, the, we should we should have also meetings like this to talk about campaigning and how to build a grassroots movement and all of that stuff, which is which is far beyond the topic that we we can uh, cover today. But uh, I do want to highlight one thing that I think is very relevant. That there there is a gap, there is a sort of wall between what activists, human rights activists, political activists, Palestinian solidarity activists are doing, and uh, and all of our world in the social media channels and in grassroots organizing on the one hand. And then there's this world of the business community and all of these financial newspapers and magazines like Wall Street Journal and uh, The Economist. And uh, and these, these um, this uh, world is, is something that we usually don't wanna 
approach very much. We see it as as very unethical and and very um, uh, off putting, and I can completely understand this. But we also have to understand that these newspapers are very ideological. They're not uh, apolitical in their position by by choosing to um, censor the news about the collapse of the Israeli economy, they are basically lying to their own readers and getting those investors who are misinformed to make wrong economic decisions and put their money on the, on the Titanic, basically. So, so they have an obligation simply as journalists to report the information that they have. I cannot count how many press releases I have sent with information like this to uh, you know AP and to Reuters and to these uh, um, uh, financial uh, newspapers um, about the shutdown nation phase of the Israeli economy and they chose not to publish it because um, they know that by publishing it they they will of course um, raise the alarm people will take out their money and and, and uh, that would harm the Israeli apartheid system, which they want to support. Uh, but we, as a movement, need to find ways to reach out to them and write letters maybe to, to those newspapers whom we maybe not regularly read uh, and tell them, look, you're not doing your journalistic duty. You've chosen to censor this information from your own readers. And uh, we're going to find other platforms to reach out to investors so they will learn that they cannot rely on, you, on these newspapers. Uh, and, and on these channels, um, unless those channels will, will start uh, reporting the truth. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. We're, we're going to wrap up, although I did want to um, say that we had uh, one question come in the end, which is kind of perfect for um, like closing with just to say that, you know, there's curiosity about what are the BDS groups uh, putting pressure on Intel? What are the what's the work happening in um, you know, big tech worker collectives against um, these kinds of investments. And that's actually gonna be a large part of our uh, webinar next week. So again, to remind folks, we're gonna be back same time, same place on Thursday to um, hear from a variety of different activists who are actually putting these principles into practice in tech companies, in the movement, the larger movement, um, in Palestine solidarity. And so we'll get, we'll get to those. And I think also there'll be some answers in the chat to that specific question. Uh, Cher, I want to thank you for coming. Um, I think we've all left with much more knowledge about, you're right, like a sector we're not really following. A lot of us activists are just not informed, um, but it's extremely consequential. Uh, it's very informational. And so thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you. All right, everyone, see you next week. Thank you.